Hello! This video is going to be covering Chapter 9, looking at the law in relation to teaching and learning. So I would like to start first by saying that uh, initially Chapter 9 was supposed to take one week for us, but once I got into it I was surprised at how much detail and how much information there was and realized there was no way we could cover it in one week. So our first week is going to be dedicated to the First Amendment. And again, I think you also will be surprised at how related this is to what we do within the field of teaching. And then the second week is going to be covering other parts of the Constitution, other federal and state laws, and um, issues regarding ethics. So let me put myself back up into the corner and let's get started. So I want to start off by talking about some limitations that teachers have in general when it comes to laws. Because one of the things I found in doing this particular video was I had a hard time finding sometimes a straightforward answer for you about what you can and cannot do, about what's legal and what's not legal. Laws are purposefully vague and general, and they do this so that they can apply the law to a variety of circumstances and so that when need be, judges can, you know, kind of use the law as they need. So because of that, again, you're going to find sometimes it's hard to get a clear answer. Also, states have different laws, so what's legal in one state might be illegal in another, which can also make things confusing. And laws might specify what your rights and responsibilities are, but they typically don't tell you what you should do. So they don't always give you advice on good practices. So, delving into the Constitution, and the reason we're starting with the Constitution is because this is our first and our final guide for telling us what is and is not legal. The Constitution is a great place to start, but did you know that the Constita Constitution does not have one explicit direct statement about education? I was surprised by that too, so you might wonder, why are we spending our first entire week on the Constitution if it doesn't say anything directly about education? Well, it is used indirectly, and let me show you what I mean. We're going to start with the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press um, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Hmm. There's a lot of information in there. And again, nowhere specifically does it say teachers, students, schools, but we're going to start here. Make no law respecting an establishment of religion. I don't know about you, but I found the wording of that a little bit confusing. So I started doing some reading. What exactly does that mean? And basically what it means is that public schools have to be neutral. They can neither inculcate a religion, which means they cannot promote or foster it. And they also cannot inhibit a religion. So they also can't prohibit you from voluntary prayer or prohibit you from being a religious person. They have to main, remain religious neutrality. That's a difficult stance. So the First Amendment has been related to the removal of religion and prayer from public schools. You might recall from our chapter looking at the history of education that the schools started off being controlled by the churches. And then they felt that the churches had too much control and perhaps there was too much focus on the Bible. So we greatly removed religion from our schools. So here's a question for you. Can students lead a prayer at a school-sponsored event? Well, we've covered this before, but according to Chapter 9, the answer is no. Hmm, I don't know about you, but... I really scratched my head at this one because I thought I'm pretty sure that the textbook said the opposite of this in an earlier chapter. So I dug through the textbook. Here's a photo of my textbook. You can see I'm a big highlighter. And an earlier chapter says that it allows voluntary prayer by teachers and students and that students can initiate prayer at school events as long as it's not endorsed by the school. So even the textbook is contradictory. 
Um, I had a hard time finding a clear answer as to whether or not students could voluntarily start a prayer. The best advice I can give you is that it appears that um, a student can voluntarily pray him or herself, but you may not be able to um, lead it at a school sponsored event and certainly the school nor the teachers can appear to sanction this prayer. So you may not be able to pray at a graduation, you know, stand up at the podium and tell everyone to bow their heads and pray. Uh, okay, next. Religious clubs and organizations can meet on public school grounds. Did you know that? Well, in Ohio, that is actually a fairly recent change. So there's a new um, law in Ohio saying um, Ohio Student Religious Liberty Acts of 2019. It gave student religious groups the same access to school facilities. So if you can have a 4-H student group meet on campus, you can have a students for Christianity meet on school campus. Um, it lifts the ban that restricted um, students' expression of their religion to just lunch or non-instructional periods and also allows them to express their religious beliefs in their assignments and um, academic products. So that's an interesting bill for the state of Ohio. Teachers can teach about religion, so they can teach about the history of Christianity, they can teach about Muslims, they can teach about Hinduism, Catholicism within a historical or an educational framework. They cannot advocate for a religion. So they cannot tell you why you should be a Christian or why they believe that Catholicism is the best. Um, they can only teach about it in a sterile educational way. Here's a case that I found that really makes this point. So this science teacher um, kept a Bible on his desk, had the Ten Commandments on the bulletin board, um, proselytized to students, you know, talking about his faith and why it was important to him, taught creationism rather than evolution. So as you can see from the highlighted part, he was warned multiple times and ignored it. And eventually he was fired. So he took it to the Supreme Court and they upheld the firing saying, you cannot, um, teach about your religion and try to encourage others to follow in your footsteps. That's not what schools are for. So there you can see the First Amendment in action. So here's another one. Can religious holidays be observed in public schools like Christmas and Easter? Well, the answer is yes. I'm sure we all remember having these celebrations when we were in school, but they have to be celebrated in a secular way. That means so Christmas, you can have Santa Claus and you can have a Christmas tree, but you cannot talk about the birth of Jesus and Easter. You can have the Easter bunny and Easter egg hunts, but do not speak of Advent or the death of Jesus. So your religious holidays must be kept secular. Now the first amendment does contain more than just its relation to religion in schools. The freedom of speech is a very big issue within the realm of schools. So the moment you walk into your school, your rights don't end. You still have freedom of speech, but there are a lot of limitations. Your speech cannot interfere with the school. It cannot disrupt learning. Um, it cannot interfere with the school's mission. We're going to be looking at how this affects both teachers and students, but we're going to start with teachers. So. If teachers have freedom of speech, can they teach whatever they want? Can they just stand up in the classroom and talk about their beliefs and feelings? Not really. Now, teachers do have the right to choose their content and to decide how they're going to teach their content, keeping in mind their professional judgment and all that means to be a professional. That is protected by the First Amendment. But... When it comes to what they teach, it's influenced by a lot of factors as to whether or not it's acceptable. First of all, what is the teacher's goal um, for this topic that they're discussing or what they're saying? So if you look down below, this teacher that says, let's burn one. Okay, but within the context of burning copper fragments and observing the range of visible light emitted, that's acceptable. 
his goal was to relate that to science, so therefore that works. It also depends on the age of the students. What is acceptable in a 12th grade classroom is very different from what's acceptable in a kindergarten classroom. Then it also has to deal with, well, how relevant is what you're talking about to the course and to the learning objectives? Does it actually have anything to do with the curriculum that you're supposed to teach? So here's a teacher in California. He was fired because he started talking about the military. So he had a student in his classroom <clears throat> um, who was wearing a Marine's sweatshirt. And for some reason, this caused the teacher to start to talk about the military. And he said that only dumb people join the military and that they are the lowest of the low. And he went on. Well, he ended up being fired for this discussion he had in his classroom. And I found it interesting that when the school board and the administrators talked about why they fired him, they didn't say it was because what he said was inflammatory or hate speech or anything like that. He said, they said, you know what, there's a curriculum that needs to be taught. And this was not the curriculum, basically. And he also talked about the fact that you can't, you know, espouse your personal values to your students. So again, teachers can't just teach anything that they want. It does have to relate to the course curriculum. It does have to remain professional. And then it also um, has to keep in mind the policies of the school. I would say that most likely private schools have a lot more restrictions regarding what they do and don't want their teachers to speak, speak about and teach about in the classroom, especially if they are a religious school. Additionally, you need to consider whether or not the content or the method is considered um, a generally approved practice. Is it something that other professionals in the field find acceptable? One example I found of this is the idea of teaching from a banned book list. So here we have a uh, teacher, he teaches English. Uh, he was suspended because he was teaching a particular novel, Sherman Alexie's novel, The Absolutely True Diary of the Part-Time Indian. So he was suspended from teaching for nine days. So this is a book that has come under fire before. It is on the library's list of the most challenged books because it talks about things like poverty, alcoholism, and sexuality. So because this is a book that's considered somewhat profane, um, and again, somewhat sexually explicit, he was suspended because this is a book that would not be considered generally acceptable or part of typical practice within his field. All right, well, that's not the only place where freedom of speech affects teachers. What about teacher walkouts and teacher protests? So the First Amendment, in addition to talking about the freedom of speech, it also talks about the right to peaceably assemble. Do teachers have that right as well? Well, walkouts during school. So if during the school day they walk out of their classroom to protest, that is not considered protected speech. Because remember, freedom of speech for teachers and students is speech that is not to be disruptive, and that would certainly be disruptive to learning. Now, you might recall in 2018, there were a number of teacher walkouts, um, most of them connected to poor funding, whether it was teacher salaries or poor funding of schools. So I found some different articles from that time period. Uh, I like this one. So can my school fire me for participating in a rally or a walkout? So again, walking out of school while on the clock during a school day would not be protected under the First Amendment because at that point, you're no longer a private citizen. You are an employee of the school. Um, so if you walk out without the permission of your school administration, it could be viewed as unprofessional or insubordinate conduct, and you could be penalized uh, or punished for that in some way. So what about protests? Well, protests during your own free time are protected speech, because at that point you are a citizen. Now, typically when I'm talking about protests, I'm referring to the teacher protests. 
teacher protests where they're protesting regarding salaries or funding for schools, safety of schools, if they feel like their schools have become too dilapidated, dilapidated due to lack of funding. There were a lot of those in 2018 as well. Um, so as a general rule, no, you cannot be disciplined for participating in an action, march, or rally on your own time outside of work. This is considered to be protected. But I would bet if you did a search online, you could find teachers that were fired for protests that were considered disruptive, contrary to the mission of the school, perhaps. So I bet there is some wiggle room there. Let's continue. Uh, here's a short video talking about some of these issues. disrespect so this shows support and it just thrills us and we're not doing this just for the raise we're doing it for PEIA and the respect Virginia is slowly dying and I hate to say that but everybody is leaving I have a son who is in college I have a daughter who will be in college next year and they will not stay in this state so it's about our students and staying here we have to make sure that we have something to offer them and we don't right now we have nothing I think that's a great video to really refresh our minds of what was happening in 2018 and West Virginia and other states started to follow in their footsteps um, so strikes like that, that was an organized walkout, organized protest and strike. Those are typically managed by the unions during their bargaining agreements. Uh, and in fact, during those particular protests in Charleston, both of my sister-in-laws who are a kindergarten and a third grade teacher were both there. Uh, that was quite a moment for the state of West Virginia. All right. So that is the end of part one. For week one of chapter nine, thanks for being with me and please continue with part two.